It's evident today that corporations raise and spend huge amounts of money on the political campaigns of presidents and congressmen. These corporations also spend huge amounts of money hiring former government officials to lobby Congress to pass laws that mainly benefit their interests. If so, have we allowed entities other than people to monopolize government? The Founding Fathers were very concerned about the use of political power to benefit special interest groups, what they call factions, small segments of society that had their own selfish concerns that didn't relate to the benefit of others. So they wanted as much as possible to restrain the ability of the general government to engage in that kind of behavior. The system that we have today of interventionism serves the interests of, of the lobbyists and they represent the uh, international corporations because they have influence and they say what we need is lobbying reform to keep the lobbyists from lobbying. That is not the answer because lobbying is just petitioning the government. We have a right to do that. What we have to do, there's two answers to that. One, if you had the right people in Washington, the right members of Congress who would not yield to the temptation of being influenced by money the whole program would, it would cease. They wouldn't have any more influence, but that doesn't seem to happen. The real solution is getting the government out of the business of being able to pass out favors so there's no incentive for the businessman to come and lobby the member of Congress. Have we allowed corporate power to influence the creation of laws that fail to benefit the people? Are we allowing corporations to reconfigure the laws of this nation to suit their purposes at the expense of real people? Do you feel special interests have hijacked Congress? I don't. No, I think they've got a valuable part to play because they are uh, experts in their area and they can provide some good, uh, good guidance for, for the congressmen who aren't specialists in these areas. Lawyers will argue that indeed corporations are people. They will argue that they are even good corporate citizens. But is a corporation really a citizen? Or for that matter, even a person? And what about a multinational corporation? Is that even a citizen of the United States? There's no doubt in my mind that the political apparatus of the United States government is much more beholden to the powerful lobbying interests, the companies that can write those big fat checks, campaign contributions and that sort of thing. Uh, you can see it every day. The politicians will give speeches, very good speeches in some cases, saying all the things that the voters want to hear. But then when it comes time to vote on an issue, they quite often will go directly opposite to what they said, and they will vote in favor of the positions that the corporations want and the lobbyists want. Did the Founding Fathers write the Constitution for real flesh and blood people or for corporations, artificial entities that are creations of the state? If one suspects the Constitution was written with real people in mind, then is it fair to those real people that artificial people get to write and influence the passage of all manner of laws? and expect these laws to be binding upon those same real flesh and blood people. Public officials have become less concerned with what people want or with what Americans, the common American thinks. What's the uh, solution? Well, what kind of a government is this? It's a go self-government. Right? Self-government is not a spectator sport. If people don't participate in it, either running for office themselves or becoming involved with uh, political campaigns or becoming in, involved with public education on issues, well, then you're going to leave by default control in the hands of the small number of people who do those things. And the smaller that group becomes and the more they see that the general population is really uh, disinterested or even impotent in uh, political affairs, the more they will tend to think, well, we can run things our own way. We don't have to remain in touch with the people because they don't count. Just as Marxism called for workers of the world to unite, a different totalitarian ideology calls for corporations of the world to unite. Not only unite with each other, consolidation, but unite with governments, with states. Thus, when corporations unite with the state, it is known as fascism. 
Fascism develops when the state initiates the merger of corporate power with state power, as what happened in Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. The key words being merge and power. Fascism is thus not a merger of the state and corporations per se, it's a merger of their power. Secondly, it's the merged power that governs, not either the state or the corporations per se. Today, however, with multinational corporations growing into entities, some larger than states, we have emerging a totally unprecedented form of fascism, what could be called corporate fascism. Have you ever heard of corporate fascism? If so, what is it? I'm not familiar with that term specifically. I could take a guess at it, where I assume that it, it, it reflects on the the amount of money that's available for large, large corporations to support lobbying and have an influence on what laws are passed and not passed. Under corporate fascism, corporations are so huge that they have the financial ability to initiate powerful lobbying influences over governments, even the Congress and Presidency of the United States. Thus, even though such multinationals and the U.S. states are able to remain distinct, Again, it's their merged power that increasingly supersedes the will of we the people. Have you ever heard of corporate fascism? If so, what is it? Um, I've read about it on CNN. I don't know if I can actually define it. If I had to say corporate fascism is probably just greed, corporate greed, and just hypocrisy. One of the earliest examples of corporate fascism can be found in the current U.S. banking system. This system, known as the Federal Reserve System, or FED, is a quasi-private, government-sanctioned banking cartel, little different from OPEC or any other cartel. Just as OPEC dictates the amount and price of oil, the Federal Reserve dictates the amount and price of money. Federal Reserve in its very nature is contrary to a free market. The Federal Reserve is not only regulating, but it's manipulating the marketplace against the will of uh, the people who are conducting the marketplace. By setting interest rates and determining the amount of money in circulation, this cartel presents the illusion of working for the general welfare, but in reality, it always acts in the best interests of, not only itself, but its prime lenders and borrowers, the U.S. government, the major New York banks, and the multinational corporations. With this unlimited balance sheet, the Fed can effectively create as much money as it wants to satisfy Congress's wayward spending habits. This money, known as legal tender, is money not backed by gold, but created by mere government fiat, and now mandated as payment for all debts, public and private. Known as fiat currency, this so-called money is regulated not by the free market, but by a Federal Reserve Open Market Committee that deliberates in secrecy. It is the Federal Reserve System that is at the heart of endless bailouts and the too-big-to-fail syndrome, a system that creates endless amounts of money that fuels wars and the fascist globalist agenda by basically two mechanisms, monetizing debt and fractional reserve. Today, the U.S. currency is backed by nothing but debt in the form of U.S. bonds. This is known as monetizing debt, the act of converting debt into money. Debt causes inflation because the Federal Reserve System facilitates the conversion of government bonds, government IOUs, into Federal Reserve notes, what we use as a currency. 
When this is done, the money supply is inflated. When the money supply is inflated, it becomes watered down or diluted. Just like stock, when a corporation authorizes and issues more stock, existing shareholders are diluted. When money is diluted, it has less purchasing power. When it has less purchasing power, prices rise because it takes more Federal Reserve notes to purchase a given product. When prices rise, it has the effect of a tax. Inflation is therefore a hidden tax. If you can delay the payment and hide the payment, that is, borrow money or print money, uh, those who really pay the price are hard to find. They're usually the poor people in the middle class. So it's, it's a very uh, specific plan to have a central bank to destroy money. It's been done for thousands of years. They used to dilute the metals or clip the coins, or uh, even in the old days they tried printing money. Today we do it with a computer. Thus, corporate fascism uses debt, which generates the hidden tax of inflation, to fund it list operations and expansion. As far as fractional reserve banking is concerned, that's a problem of fraud. That is, fractional reserve banking is where the bank generates more paper currency than it has, say, gold and silver reserves on a, on a species standard. And it can really generate as much paper currency as the market is willing to bear, as long as the market has some credence that the bank will pay. And what tends to happen is that the banks overexpand. Uh, they play too many of those cards. And at a certain stage, the market says, no, there's too much money out here in terms of real resources. And you get what's called a bank run. People come back to the banks and say, well, make good on these promises. The banks can't do it. You have recession, depression, what have you, the whole credit structure drops. Now, if that kind of a system were fully disclosed and everyone knew how it was working, my anticipation is that there would be very few fractional reserve banks. The framers of the Constitution were quite aware of the liabilities of bills of credit and fractional reserve banking. And this is why Article I states, no state shall make anything but gold and silver a tender in the payment of debts. And, quote, no state shall emit bills of credit. The Federal Reserve System should be abolished. It was not authorized in the Constitution, therefore we shouldn't have it. But I have to take a sort of a moderate approach to doing it because there's a lot of people who depend on the system today and I wouldn't close it down in one day, but I would legalize competition, allow gold and silver to circulate as money, take taxes off gold and silver so you didn't have to pay sales taxes or capital gains taxes, and let the people transition over to gold and silver. In 1976, we weren't even allowed to own gold. And then later on, we got the American Gold Eagle. So we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, but we need to go a little bit further to legalize uh, contracts in gold. The real culprit is the ability of the Fed to monetize debt. Members of Congress spend money for war and welfare. They can't borrow enough and they can't tax enough, so they literally create treasury bills out of thin air, and then the Federal Reserve creates money out of thin airs and buys the treasury bills, and that has to eventually destroy the value of the dollar. If we were to abolish the Federal Reserve System tomorrow and get the banks out of it completely, turn the entire function as it now operates over to the Treasury, nothing would change. The same people would still dominate the system from behind the scenes. So this question of ownership receives too much attention because where that idea goes is that, well, if we can just find out who owns these banks, and if we don't like who they are, then we can uh, support a move to abolish the Federal Reserve and turn that system over to the Treasury, exactly as it's now operating. So the focus should not be on who owns the banks, but on what the banks are doing. If the public better understood how fiat money can be abused by Congress, it would impeach almost every member and abolish the Federal Reserve Central Bank, as it has done twice in the nation's history. General is the problem. What did the Founding Fathers intend when they wrote those words. 
General welfare has been debated since the Constitution itself. The founders knew that Rome and every society since the beginning of time had poor, sick, and unfortunate, and many of these societies tried to help. For instance, in 1597, England had the Elizabethan Poor Laws enacted to provide what were known as the Seven Corporeal Works of Mercy. These works were to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, attend the sick, visit the prisoner, and bury the dead. But is this how you really promote the general welfare, the founders asked? What would happen if you created a society that could actually rise above problems? A society where the government gently facilitated a free and prosperous citizenry. A citizenry so successful, there were no hungry. There were no sick or poor. There were no criminals. The Constitution gives Congress the power and the responsibility to provide for the general welfare of the nation. So important is the idea of general welfare, this is the only term that is stated twice in the Constitution, once in the preamble and again in Article I. Well, the Constitution was written to limit the size and scope of government. It was to uh, recognize that government was there to protect our liberties. Over 25,000 laws are enacted every year, many by congressmen that have been bought and paid for by multinational corporations, all non-people entities. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. If you remain in this immediate vicinity, you will be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code, no matter what your purpose is. What comes to mind is big corporations that put their view of the world out there for everyone, um, take over small businesses, take over um, choices that people might have, different kinds of products where everything becomes much more generic and just based on cost as opposed to quality and workmanship. Because term limits have not been established for the Congress, most congressmen have been able to stay in office for decades. Again, this is the Supreme Court. States were enacting and imposed term limits on their members of Congress uh, in something like half the American states, and the Supreme Court overthrew it and took the right away from the states to impose term limits on their own members of Congress. And what did Congress do? They said, that's fine with us, because we'll stay in power. It seems the more a congressman is entrenched, the more he is able to build a social network, a network of cronies. Clearly, good relationships with fellow congressmen serve many productive purposes, but such a network can also be abused. After all, it's much easier to minimize the risks of vote swapping, a form of collusion, amongst cronies. It's much easier to justify corporate campaign contributions, a form of bribery, amongst cronies. And it's much easier to get away with earmarks, a form of fraud, amongst cronies. Thus, an entrenched Congress, especially one cast into only two major political parties would seem to be in the perfect position to imperceptibly usurp power from the people and place it into the hands of the corporate fascists that have hijacked Congress. The right place to look for a solution to the problem of corrupt politicians is at the voter and their perception of who they're voting for and what the political principles of their candidates are. You can bet Collusion, bribery, and fraud are not practices the founders envisioned for a more perfect union. So unless I have this view that I need to participate in this system as a self-governing citizen to maintain the integrity of the system, 
The system will eventually be dominated from the top down by the people who can actually make something from gaming it, as the expression goes. So uh, this is the Founding Fathers' point. It depends upon having a virtuous citizenry that is willing to shoulder the burdens of maintaining a self-governmental structure. Again, general welfare includes everyone, especially the vast majority of average citizens who fall within the middle of the social spectrum. In statistical terms, the average, or mean, is represented at the top, or crest, of what's known as a bell-shaped curve. It's the middle of the bell-shaped curve. So it's fair to say that the original intent of the Constitution is to define a government that serves the general population, the middle of the bell-shaped curve, now known as the middle class. Do you sense a dwindling middle class or a wealth disparity? Well, I think things are changing right now. I think the last, uh, the last eight years have been uh, uh, increasing, increasing wealth disparity, but I think some of the excesses of those days uh, may be over. The terms spreading the wealth, redistribution, and wealth disparity are meaningless in an America that truly responds to the original intent of the Constitution. Many have commented that we now have a monstrous tax system, a system that taxes its citizens far more than citizens of the Boston Tea Party era. If two to three percent taxation justified a revolution in 1776, why doesn't 50% and growing justify a revolution? If a few little excise taxes on pieces of paper and tea justified open lawlessness from these rebels that we're all celebrating, why don't the myriad of incomprehensible, unavoidable, crushing taxes state, local, and federal, why don't they justify a revolution today? of the world. So instead of a government now that uh, occupies so many other countries and we have 700 bases overseas, that wouldn't happen if we had the proper size government. Obey your orders! Understand the orders you are taking right now are unconstitutional. Yes. Understand right now what you guys are doing here today will play effect throughout history. The Germans listened to their orders. The Germans violated their civil rights, God-given rights, in Nazi Germany in the 30s by simply listening to unconstitutional orders and not questioning authority. We are here because we mean no harm to you. We are tired of these private federal reserve bankers who are running this country and destroying this country from the inside. The tyranny that they commit Given the events of the day, it's easy to see we have wandered from the original intent of the Founding Fathers. As a result, it seems our wayfaring government has converted us from a modest republic into a global empire. As a consequence, the empire requires vast sums to operate at home and abroad. The trouble is every empire, whether you're talking about Rome or the Soviet Union, it's all based on the enslavement of humanity. And 
however well structured it is and however powerful it seems at any given time, that will only last so long. And I think people are starting to catch glimpses of the fact that that's true about the United States too. And everybody said, oh, it'll be around forever. It won't because uh, basically the tyrants who run the show and have been playing the game played it too far as they always do and will be collapsing their own game. It's nice that it always goes that way, that eventually every empire collapses and gives humanity basically another chance to try freedom. Some spent abroad satisfy the corporate fascist agenda of the multinationals. Is it thus any wonder the national debt is now well over $10 trillion? How can we do this? Do you feel the federal government has grown too big? No, I do not. I, I feel that it's probably not big enough given the problems that we have right now. I think it should probably be bigger. Ben Franklin might have answered this question by saying that Americans are too good-hearted. As a result, we have been overly generous to the poor and overly accommodating to the rich. All the while, we have failed to provide for the engine that keeps America strong, the middle class, those neither rich or poor. Do you feel the federal government has grown too big? Uh, yes, I do, and I think it's continuing to get too big. National debt is too high. Uh, and of course, we were paying it down until things took a U-turn somewhere about eight years ago. We are spending almost a half trillion dollars a year on the military, more than the combined spending of the next 25 nations. I think we do spend too much on the military, but not enough on social programs. We spend 4% of our gross national product on national defense, and we're committed to defend half of the world. You can't do that. Uh, we are facing imperial overstretch. That's what happened to the British Empire. And 10 years of war showed that the British Empire was overstretched, and it collapsed totally. Eisenhower was dead right about the military industrial complex. What more can you say than that? Just look around you, and there you see it everywhere. As earlier discussed, lobbyists that flow money to keep certain congressmen in power have configured our laws in such a way they now benefit multinational corporations more than they benefit we the people. These used to be American companies. There were great names, famous names, Boeing, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, GE, and others, and they're still great companies but they're no longer strictly American companies. They're global companies. And what they want to do is produce at the cheapest price they possibly can. And where are they going to get the cheapest workers? They're going to get them in Latin America, in Mexico, in the Far East, and in China. So what these multinational companies are now doing is they are transferring their plants and their factories and their technology over where production is cheapest and maintaining completely free access to the consumers in the United States. What the transnational companies profit from is basically by getting rid of their American workers but keeping their American consumers. And in this sense, they no longer have any kind of a loyalty to the community where they were raised or to the states or to the country. At our peril, we ignore the advice given to us by Jefferson and Washington when they warned us about getting involved in entangling relations around the world. We are giving billions away in foreign aid to governments that are involved in conflicts. And when we do this, it involves us in their conflicts. Uh, President Washington said, we can trust to temporary alliances in times of necessity. Between 1778, when we had our alliance with France, which lapsed in 1800, and 1949, the United States never entered an alliance with any other country. Then we established NATO as a defensive alliance against the Soviet Empire, and we drew a red line across Germany. That was a temporary necessity in the Cold War. When the Cold War ended, the United States should have reviewed 
all of its treaty commitments to Japan and Korea and Taiwan and Europe and all over the world and abrogated or dissolved all the alliances that no longer serve the vital national interest of the United States. The Constitution doesn't give the federal government the right to form any alliances like that, um, where we give our sovereignty to these sort of supernatural national uh, bodies. You know, now I basically say that there is no uh, point for it. It's basically to uh, expend our interventionism and to uh, protect our empire. Because of the conflicts we have now become entangled in, we have over 800 military bases and outposts stationed in over 130 countries around the world. To maintain this infrastructure, we have to spend almost $500 billion a year. Some say a trillion dollars a year when you factor in debt service and long-term medical care for veterans. Uh, we are facing imperial overstretch. That's what happened to the British Empire. And 10 years of war showed that the British Empire was overstretched and it collapsed totally after World War II. The United States should simply shed these commitments to fight all over the world on behalf of nations which have nothing to do with the vital interest of the United States. In an attempt to optimize the world stage for capitalism in the name of spreading democracy. If America doesn't stand up for the cause of freedom, who will, Carl? We have, over the past 50 years, resorted to both overt and covert operations. The Bush Doctrine is open-ended. It is, we cannot be secure unless the world is democratic and we have a right to interfere in the internal affairs of every country on earth to make them democratic. It is an absurdity. We are undertaking an assignment we cannot fulfill. It is endless. It is a formula for perpetual war, for perpetual peace. It is clear by failing to follow the original intent of the Constitution, we the people have allowed the rogue politicians that now infest Congress the Supreme Court and the executive to involve us in endless wars, hence endless debt. We spend endless amounts of money into the military industrial complex, which Eisenhower warned us about. Yet all we seem to get in return is perpetual war. The very wise and wealthy financiers of the world going way back even before Rothschild's time, I've observed that the world was a pretty rotten place to live in, uh, that nations were always fighting over something or other. There always somebody was always trying to conquer somebody else, and wars were universal. Too bad about that, but that's the way it is. So we found out that we bankers, that if we loan money to them, that um, we get paid back. They don't question what the interest rate is because they're fighting a war. And if they can win the war, they can just plunder the victim and pay us whatever we want out of the plunder. It doesn't cost them anything, really. Then the issue comes up, well, what happens if one of these nations uh, decides not to pay us? Ah, the answer is very simple. If they refuse to pay us back, we'll finance an opposing nation or a revolutionary group somewhere else to become an enemy of that nation and attack it and destroy it, invade it. We'll create another war, in other words, in order to get our money back. We'll finance this side to attack that side. So by financing all sides in a war and keeping the world divided up into warring factions so that no one unit is particularly stronger than the other, the banks can continue to finance all sides of wars forever and always collect their interest because they have the ability of, put one nation, of putting one nation against another nation against another nation to collect their debts. The military and banking beasts we have allowed to flourish and prosper are eating up money we could be placing towards rejuvenating the school system, the health care system, maintaining bridges, roads and levees, developing fusion, solar and ethanol energy technologies, allowing savings and capital formation to reduce the cost of products, and providing better paying jobs for the middle class. Many of our actions and foreign policies have been beneficial and delivered in a good American spirit. However, we have also allowed our government to do some nasty and selfish things, as John Baker explains in his article, Blowback.
the cost and consequences of American foreign policy. Blowback is a term whereby you take an action abroad, such as we overthrew the Mossadegh in 1953 in Iran, and blowback came when the Shah we installed was overthrown in 1979 by nationalistic forces, and we got a worse situation than we had. We have, in the past, supported questionable rulers, rulers that have turned against us, such as Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. The IMF World Bank, which is heavily funded by fiat money created by the U.S. Federal Reserve System, lends money to subprime borrowers in third world nations. And then, when they inevitably default on their loans, the U.S., through corporate agents, forces concessions known as structured settlements on such countries. Concessions include granting the U.S. sweetheart deals on natural resources, such as oil, profit participation in their public utilities, certain voting patterns at the U.N., land for yet more U.S. military bases, and free access to canals, such as the Panama Canal. When countries don't play ball with the U.S. empire, the Empire strikes back. We send in the military, as was the case with Iraq. I do believe that the Iraq is the greatest strategic blunder, certainly in my lifetime, because we attacked and invaded a country that did not threaten us, did not want war with us, uh, and, and really, and did not have the weapons of mass destruction we said it had. It was an utterly unnecessary war. It has cost 4,000 American dead, 33,000 wounded, 600, 700 billion dollars on the way to trillions of dollars. It has antagonized and alienated the entire Arab and Islamic world. I think it has helped to break the Bush presidency. And I can't think of any gain worthwhile that we have gotten as a consequence of this war. This war could be the beginning of the end of the United States as a superpower and as the lone superpower on Earth. I have to say that most wars in our modern age, in my view, are unjust because they're, they're being fought over reasons which are not honestly stated. They're being fought over hidden agendas. But we must keep in mind that there is a theoretical basis for a just defensive war. And in a defensive war, if somebody's trying to attack us and take over our country, truly, truly do, not something that our political leaders have created this myth about, but really is truly happening, then we would gain by winning that war. Because if we didn't win it, we would lose our freedom. The mere fact that we are involved in so many unethical and entangling relationships the world over makes it inevitable that we will cause severe antagonism and perpetual war. Such antagonism has precipitated blowback in the form of attacks on our embassies, ships, and buildings. September 11, 2001 was the most dramatic example. 9-11 was indeed blowback for massive American intervention in the Middle East, supporting Saudi Arabia, putting our troops in there, uh, the Iraq war, and aiding uh, the overthrow of the Afghans. In effect, uh, it came back to bite us. The 9-11 terrorists were over here because we are over there. By projecting our military to secure oil in Iraq and Saudi Arabia, rather than securing the blessings of liberty, we are causing conflict that is destroying domestic tranquility. Oh, it's easy to blame it all on the Democrats or the Republicans or even the Islamic radicals. But as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. The buck stops with we the people and how well we self-govern pursuant to the U.S. Constitution.
In short, by allowing our elected officials to receive campaign contributions from corporate entities, all non-people, we are causing all these bad things to happen because such elected officials cannot possibly be true to both the U.S. Constitution and the fascist agenda of globalization. Governments, including our own, will always seek excuses to expand, and war is one of the primary tools a government uses to expand its power. World War I, did that provide a net gain. It destroyed one of the most uh, stable international structures the world had seen throughout history. It brought about the Bolshevik Revolution, it brought, brought about the Nazi Revolution, it brought about World War Depression, it brought about World War II. So we'd say it certainly was not a net gain that came out of World War I. It's hard to see the net gain really that came out of World War II. Uh, Hitler was defeated and you ended up with Stalin with more power than Hitler ever had. Uh, the Japanese were defeated, you end up with Mao Zedong in control of China. War is the health of the state, according to author Randolph Bourne. It's up to we the people to maintain our health by keeping our government under good control. We the people ordained and established the Constitution of the United States of America in order to ensure domestic tranquility, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. The United States is the greatest nation on earth. We have coexisted with monarchies, with despotisms, with dictatorships. We have been the most secure nation on earth, and we maintain our security by maintaining strong, powerful military forces to defend and protect us and the will to fight in our vital national interests and letting the world know that and staying out of wars that are none of our business. That's how we survived in the 20th century as the one great power to enter the 20th century uh, that left it still a great power. What happened to the British Empire, the French Empire, the Russian Empire? the Ottoman Empire, the Hohenzollern Empire, the, all the rest of them, the Japanese Empire, all smashed, all destroyed oh, because they were overextended and they got into wars that carried them too far and were none of their business. That is where we're headed right now with these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and plotting war on Iran and all the rest. It is not essential to our vital security and we ought not to be doing it. The only way this can be done is for we, the people, to read and understand the U.S. Constitution, as well as the underlying philosophy behind it, and insist that the people we vote into office apply it to the letter, not just give it lip service. Anyone who doesn't believe this has no right to call themselves an American citizen or a representative of we, the people. There are a lot of factors connected with our drift away from constitutional principles. Among these, the most debilitating is our banking system, the Federal Reserve. Even though the Fed was created by an act of Congress in 1913, its operation and relationship with the U.S. government is amorphous, if not completely nebulous to the public. Some claim this is by design, for the Fed conveniently operates as a close partner when Congress needs to borrow yet more money, but an independent agency when it's convenient to insulate itself from political fallout or its part in precipitating recessions. Thus, in 1913, Congress delegated its duty to manage the money supply to a bunch of elite New York bankers who formed a banking cartel now known as the Federal Reserve System. When the Federal Reserve System was planned in 1910, it was done so without the full knowledge and consent of the people. Born in secrecy on an island off the coast of Georgia, elite bankers of the time sought to establish a central bank that would mimic European banks and ultimately give them complete control over the nation's money. The Federal Reserve is technically owned by the member banks, 
So we know who owns the Federal Reserve, the member banks. But who owns the member banks is uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to find out because the member banks uh, are not registered with any government agency. They're not corporations. They have the basic structure of a partnership or something very private. It may even be something unique, but it's not on the public record. And the owners or the partners of these banks are not about to let it be known. No, it's true that you can buy stock uh, in you know, Chase Manhattan and all that sort of thing. You can buy stock in the Bank of America and you know, as a stockholder you're listed. But the true control and ownership is not on the public record. And it's, it's easy to hide that. You can use street names, you can use Swiss accounts, you can have corporations holding stock for other corporations which are holding stock for other corporations and that sort of thing. In general, it's, it's possible to completely conceal the controlling interest from, of the banks from the public. From 1913 to 1971, the elite Federal Reserve bankers managed to slowly decouple the nation's currency from the gold and silver backing required by the Constitution. In 1971, the Fed cartel finally got Richard M. Nixon to disconnect the last vestiges of gold from money on the pretense that the British and French were redeeming too many of their Federal Reserve notes for gold, something people in countries are supposed to do when Congress and bankers print up too many Federal Reserve notes. But when you went off the gold standard, finally, when we cut it loose in 1971, when I was in Nixon's White House, uh, and the reason we did, we went off the gold standard totally, was that all these dollars that we had poured out in the United States had gone abroad, and the British were coming in with our dollars, demanding gold at $35 an ounce or $42 an ounce, they would have cleaned us out. So Nixon shut the gold window. Now that the bond between gold and paper money has finally been broken, over the period of 1913 to 1971, the elite bankers print up as much fiat currency as Congress demands for all manner of welfare and warfare purposes. Of course, anybody who likes big government, whether it's for the welfare state or for warfare, do not like the restraints of, uh, of a gold standard because then governments would have to pay for everything. They'd have to tax the people. And if the people were taxed today for all the welfare and all the warfare, it, all, all of it would end. The relationship between fiat money and wars is direct and immediate. Wars at the scale that we know them in the modern world would simply not be possible. And they would not happen if it weren't possible for the nations who are waging those wars to raise the money from their population through the hidden tax called inflation. Inflation is caused by the Federal Reserve System through fiat money, the creation of money out of nothing. So if it were not for fiat money, most of the wars that we've known in recent times simply would not have been fought on either side. Ultimately, all the money that is used to stimulate, rescue, or bail out corporate entities that are too big to fail comes from the Federal Reserve System's power to create money out of thin air, also known as monetized debt, as more fully covered in the movie Fiat Empire. The 2008 Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, AIG, and $700 billion Wall Street bailout root cause fiat money, not subprime lending, as Treasury Secretary Paulson claimed, are only the most recent examples. Other bailouts in past decades have been Penn Central Railroad, 1970, Lockheed, 1970, New York City, 1975, Chrysler, 1978, Commonwealth Bank, 1972, First Pennsylvania Bank, 1979, Chicago Continental Bank, 1982, and the entire U.S. savings and loan system in the 1980s. The Federal Reserve System makes all this moral hazard possible. 
Even though the original intent of the founders was for Congress to be the most prominent branch of our government, today's congressmen are shirking this responsibility. They do this by improper delegation of their duties and responsibilities to outside agencies, committees, other branches of government, and even private entities. Why? so they can avoid blame for such things as bailouts and wars and stay in office as long as possible. To the degree they can get the courts or the president to decide on the tough issues, they can avoid making unpopular choices, choices that could get them voted out. Money is the primary touchy issue because money represents the energy of the citizens. Yes, people are very concerned about their wages, credit, stocks, and money. Given this, what could be more relevant than Article 1, Section 8, which states, Congress shall have power to coin money and regulate its value. Section 10 then goes on to say that no state shall emit bills of credit or make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. The meaning is clear. Gold and silver, when coined, are the only things that are money. Regulate its value? What does this mean? It means Congress is charged with the responsibility to run a quality control check on all weights and measures, which allow money to be counted, thus valued. How can you ethically value money unless you can ethically count it? That said, most people don't realize that a dollar is a unit of weight, like a pound or an ounce or a ton. In the U.S., a dollar is the unit of weight of pure precious metal in coin form. Thus, one dollar of silver weighs 0.77 troy ounces. In the early 1900s, one dollar of gold weighed 0.048 troy ounces. Given the real definition of the word dollar, it's easy to see what the Constitution is talking about when it charges Congress with the responsibility of maintaining the value of a dollar in terms of honest weights and measures. But today, people, and even Congress, misinterpret the original intent of Article I in other ways. They think it's Congress's job to maintain the value of the dollar by adjusting interest rates or adjusting the money supply, what's known as an elastic currency. An elastic currency is blatantly illegal per Article I. Congress has no authority to allow the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee to adjust interest rates. Only the free market has the authority to adjust interest rates through the billions of individual transactions made by hundreds of millions of citizens. Thus, the cost of money, the interest rate, should be valued by the free market, not the Federal Reserve System. The gold standard, in my judgment, is the right standard to have the problem with it is this. There is no gold standard which is going to bind politicians and prevent them from creating dollars. As they create the dollars to pay for wars and other things, then people realize that the dollars aren't that valuable and they come for the gold. And in other words, politicians will inflate the currency regardless of a gold standard. And we have found that gold standards collapse because politicians do things to make it to collapse. But you can't print up gold or silver. Gold and silver take human effort to acquire. Thus, the supply of money can be regulated by the price of gold and silver in the free market. On the other hand, money based on paper with no ties to gold or silver can be endlessly printed up. 
thus regulated not by the free market, but misregulated by the state. With this kind of money, bills of credit, the government can print up as much money as it wants, thus watering down everyone else's money. We call this loss of purchasing power when it happens, and it has happened plenty. It now takes 100 pennies to buy what only five pennies could buy back in 1913, the year the Federal Reserve System was established. Where does Congress get most of its funding? I would like to say from us, but I'm sure they have uh, foreign investors that they also get their money from us. They print it. And can you elaborate on that? They have no funding. They have no money. It's all puff and mirrors. They have no money. It's all an illusion. There's, there's not much in back of it. The dollar has just uh, gone down precipitously much faster now. So the dollar of 1913 uh, probably is worth about three cents today. And uh, e even today it's going down uh, rapidly. So as the dollar lost its backing, uh, slowly but steadily between 1913 and 1971, government did grow. But since 1971, all you have to do is look at the total obligations of the government financially, uh, the debt that has been accumulated, the powers accrued to the government, and uh, they keep growing. Ironic that Alan Greenspan, before he was co-opted as chairman of the banking cartel, wrote, quote, in the absence of a gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value." End quote. Today, judging from his book, The Age of Turbulence, Alan Greenspan seems to believe in free markets for every product, service, and commodity, except for the one commodity that's most universal the cost of money, that is, interest rates. Whereas the free market should regulate everyone else, only the open market committee at the Federal Reserve should regulate the cost and amount of money. And this regulated money should be forced on American citizens. You should have free market principles apply not only within uh, the marketplace of cars and and gadgets and widgets and whatever else so that the good will survive so that people can do good and do better so that the best will so competition can produce a healthy environment where people keep improving their product but you should have the free market within banking so how did we go so wrong why is America now a post-industrial nation with an export profile similar to a 19th century third world colony? Let's take a look at the greed of multinational corporate fascists have caused we the people to undervalue the very constitution upon which the American experiment depends. When the Cold War ended with the collapse of Marx's workers' paradise, the Soviet Union, the United States suddenly found itself the only superpower. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were about five great empires. The British Empire, the French Empire, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Russian Empire. And you might add the Ottoman, and two great nations, Japan and the United States and Japan became an empire. The end of the First World War saw the collapse of the Russian Empire, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Collapsed in the rise of Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini and Lenin. And the Second World War brought the collapse of the British Empire and the French Empire and all the lesser empires, the Portuguese and the Dutch and the Belgian. All reduced to dust because all dissipated their blood and treasure in perpetual wars. Wars are the, are the killers of empires. And the United States survived as the greatest country in the world for a single simple reason. We were the last great power to enter both world wars after most of the bloodshed had been done. American soldiers did not arrive in France in great numbers in the battles 
until the spring and summer of 1918, six months before the war ended. We went into Normandy 11 months before the end of a war, which was a six-year war for the British. So the United States stayed out of the great wars until most of the bloodletting or an awful lot of the bloodletting was done. And we came in at the end, uh, sort of like Fortinbras at the end of Hamlet. The original intent of the U.S. founders was clear and effective. Stay out of wars. Don't squander the Republic's blood and treasure. Make no permanent alliances. All traditional values. War is tolerated. In fact, war is even applauded in many cases because people are of the impression that it is to the benefit of their nation. People tolerate or applaud war if they think it's a defensive war. If they think that they're defending themselves against a dreaded enemy, you would certainly tolerate a war, you would applaud it. The object is to convince the people of all nations, including those that are doing the attacking, to convince the population that their war is really a war of defense. They have to create in the minds of their people an image of a, of a terrible enemy out there. And the reason they're attacking the enemy is because if they don't, he's going to attack them first. So it's a question of who's, who gets the first shot. From the ratification of the Constitution to World War I, Hamilton's vision guided the nation. What is Hamilton's vision? What Hamilton was saying was a nation's political independence is dependent upon its economic independence. Washington shared this vision with Hamilton because what they wanted to do was wean the Republic off a reliance on foreign trade so Americans would never again be drawn into wars of the old continent. The only way to do this, Hamilton reasoned, was to erect protective tariffs, a price of admission for foreign countries to have access to American markets. The word protection is in virtually every Republican platform from 1884 to 1948. And the protectionist period in American history, which can fairly be called from about 1860 to 1928, was the most productive in the history of the United States or of the world. At the end of that period, we manufactured 42% of the world's goods. The purpose for these tariffs was to stimulate our own people to build factories and finance a strong central government, which at the time was needed. A strategic goal enabling the people of the U.S. to be able to cut bonds of dependency upon foreign nations and create bonds of commerce amongst themselves. Further, when a nation puts a tariff on foreign goods coming into the country, it is more able to cut taxes on goods produced inside the country. But today, this is known as protectionism, a dirty word with the corporate fascists behind monopoly capitalism, media consolidation, and non-citizen multinationals that have purchased Congress. I believe a trade policy should be crafted to protect the sovereignty of the nation, the economic independence of the nation, and the standard of living of the American worker. Our present trade laws are designed to protect the freedom of transnational corporations to abandon their country, to desert their workers, and to go abroad in search of the highest immediate profits at the expense of the community and the nation that nurtured them. Free trade is supposed to mean simply no tariffs on either imported or exported goods between countries. A tariff is another word for a tax. By using the word free, the corporate elite makes free trade seem good. After all, anything that's free is good, right? While Americans buy over 45% of China's exports, China buys less than 3% of our exports. The corporate fascists pushing globalization call this free trade. But 
Is this fair trade? Let's take a closer look at the implications of this term, free trade, and see how high U.S. corporate taxes, European VAT tax rebates, and World Trade Organization rules conspire to make trade between the U.S. and the rest of the world anything but free. The, the European Union is gaming the system against the United States. For example, when we had corporate tax rates which are relatively equal, that would be a fair trade situation. Europe has cut its tax rates, average tax rates, corporations down to 24%, ours are 40%. That gives them an advantage. How do they make up the money? They impose value added tax on American imports of 15% coming into Europe and rebate the tax to European corporations exporting to the United States. This has the effect of a Smoot-Hawley tariff against the United States of America. And it is the reason why we run annual massive trade deficits with Europe. But that's not even the worst damage the corporate fascist so-called free trade has caused. In 1993, a massive free trade bill was ushered through Congress. This trade bill was known as NAFTA, short for North American Free Trade Agreement. What happens when you set up a free trade zone, as Hamilton set up in the United States, with the 13 states all becoming one common market, what happens is that a central government has to rise above it to enforce the laws and regulations. Hamilton set that up, and what rose out of that was the mighty American government. When the Europeans had the European Union, they made it initially a common market, a free trade zone. Gradually, this enormous government rose up of the European Union that now sits in Brussels, which is becoming a, a continental-wide government, and the states are losing, losing their sovereignty and independence. If you have a global economy, uh, then you're going to need some kind of political organization to manage and control it and enforce its rules. The beginnings of the world government already exist in the World Trade Organization, the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, the new International Environmental Authority, Kyoto. All of these things are the embryonic institutions of a world government. There definitely is a plan to consolidate the United States, Mexico, and Canada. It's, it's more than a plan. The beginning stages already are well underway. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on the type of government that will be created. If we had the type of constitutional republic that we were given by our forefathers, if that were in place today, and if that were the concept of the kind of a government that we were going to use in the merger of Canada and Mexico with the United States, I think it would have a lot to be said for it. I would probably be in favor of it. But that is not what's happening today. What is happening today is the merger of these three countries into a collectivist super-regional government. By collectivist, I mean it will be totalitarian in nature. There will be very little room for individual rights. It will all be dictated from the top, and it will be practically a model of what we now see happen in uh, Europe uh, and the European Union. The North American Union is uh, absolutely being built. Uh, we know about the NAFTA superhighways. Uh, we know about the trade agreements that are being set up. Um, we, we've seen a similar model already with the EU. Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty clear. 15 years later, the results of NAFTA are in. Heroin, marijuana, and illegal immigrants are pouring in over the U.S.-Mexican border. More than a million jobs, once performed in the U.S., are now performed by Mexican workers at Maquiladora plants. Among the major entities that championed NAFTA were the Council on Foreign Relations, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Heritage Foundation, the Brookings Institute, the New Republic, and the National Review. Among those who joined in opposing NAFTA were the following, Ross Perot, Pat Buchanan, Ralph Nader, the AFL-CIO, and the American people. Nevertheless, NAFTA passed. 
Did Congress care what the American people wanted? Obviously not. Behind this is, is, are basically an international elites, uh, many of whom would like to get control of the wealth and the power of the United States and transfer the decision-making authority for that to transnational governments and global governments and taking that power and authority away from the American people. You have people in the United States who are anxious to merge this country with Mexico and Canada in sort of a North American Union and then merge that with the European Union. And above that, who runs that? Just as the elites in Brussels and in Strasbourg are running the European Union, so you would have a global elite running the world economy and the United States would simply be part of this enormously productive North American province of the global economy and of the world government. There are groups, many of them I think, that are seeking to establish a new world order, uh, a world government based on the model of collectivism. You can imagine who these people would be. The ones who control others benefit from a uh, totalitarian system. In other words, uh, politicians like collectivism because collectivism puts uh, ever-increasing power into their hands. <laughs> bankers like collectivism because it gives the banks the power to create money with state sanction and state support to create money out of nothing, and that gives control over human beings. All of these people work together instinctively, even though they may have separate individual or professional goals. They do work together and support each other toward this ultimate aim of a new world order, is how they like to describe it, which is a totalitarian system based on the model of collectivism. Indeed, free trade is not free at all. It's the serial killer of the American economy and the Trojan horse of world government. It's the primrose path to the loss of economic independence and national sovereignty the founders warned us about. Free trade is a bright shining lie made possible by fascists of greedy multinationals. And fascists of greedy multinationals. By failing to follow the Constitution, Americans have allowed multinational corporations to further their fascist agenda of globalization. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. Concomitant with this collapse, both China and India saw the wisdom of changing their economic policies before they too suffered a similar fate. 400 million Russians and Eastern Europeans who had been behind the Iron Curtain suddenly joined the global economy. And then when China uh, moved toward capitalism, hundreds of millions of more workers basically went into the global economy to compete. And their competitors are American workers and European workers who were making salaries, say, of $30, $40, $50 an hour in manufacturing. And these hardworking people who are quite willing to work for less, they became an enormously attractive labor market for American industries and American factories which have been moving to China and to Mexico and to third world countries to take advantage of low wage labor, uh, very little laws and regulations, low taxes, and by so doing what's happened is the great manufacturing base of the United States has been exported. Greed-driven, Benedict Arnold CEOs were unable to resist the opportunity to fire American workers and exploit people who would work for wages five to 20 times less. Thus was born what we now call globalization, the profit-motivated act of exploiting slave labor workforces to produce cheap and unsafe products that can be sold to American consumers until they overextend themselves on credit card and home equity debt. 
In short, globalization is the daily business of the fascist multinational corporation in its psychopathic pursuit of stockholder value at the expense of human value. And the winners are the owners of the American corporations whose profits are soaring and the shareholders and the losers are first world workers, in particular American workers who are seeing their wages arrested and their wages fall and their jobs going overseas in the millions for the last 30 years. If one day I encounter a lady who just bought a toy from Walmart, I'll say, respectable customer, respectable Walmart customer, do you know why you can buy such a cheap toy from Walmart? That's because we workers work all day, every day and night. We added 125,000 new jobs around this world this past year. Good job. In the 1960s, American companies, not multinational corporations, produced 96% of all that Americans consumed. Now, a fourth of America's steel is foreign-made, a third of its cars, half of its machine tools, two-thirds of its clothes, and almost all of its shoes, radios, telephones, TVs, cameras, VCRs, and bicycles. So what these multinational companies are now doing is they are transferring their plants and their factories and their technology over where production is cheapest and maintaining completely free access to the consumers in the United States. What the transnational companies profit from is basically by getting rid of their American workers but keeping their American consumers. And in this sense, they no longer have any kind of loyalty to the community where they were raised, or to the states, or to the country. Between NAFTA and the Federal Reserve System, both gifts to the American people from greedy Wall Street financial institutions and their fascist multinational corporate clients, the U.S. has seen its dollar lose over 95% of its purchasing power seen its economic and energy independence squandered, seen its major homegrown industries decimated, seen its working men and women forced to submit to employment as debt slaves, seen its middle class placed into Darwinian competition with foreign workers making slave wages at gunpoint. And now it's seen a $700 billion taxpayer bailout of Wall Street banks and financial entities. In one generation, the house that Hamilton built has collapsed. Corporate fascists have been able to hollow out the U.S. manufacturing base and exploit the U.S. market. There have been forces working in this direction for centuries and they are coming to realize this ideal of theirs. But, but quite frankly, loyalty to globalism is thus treason to the American Republic. The Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, um, they've been talking about a world government for a long time. Uh, they've testified in Congress that they're trying to build a world government. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's pretty laid out on the table. That's, that's what's being done. The corporate fascists, having similar totalitarian goals, often work together to destroy free market capitalism and the republic the founders built. And this is the idea. Get the public focused on the left-right cockfight 
so they fail to realize that both the Democrats and the Republicans are serving other masters. This guy's hate stems from influence that you find on the left, not on the right. <laughs> this man was a mentally ill, lone wolf, leftist-inspired feminazi. I would strongly, strongly argue that the true political spectrum is nothing that is generally perceived. Because, of course, you have this crazy system where the very left wing is communism and the very right wing is fascism. But those two things are virtually the same. There's, there's a tyranny of corporations and there's a tyranny of the state. There, on the Republican side, you have those who want to restrict your social freedoms, uh, like drugs and uh, gay marriage or whatever, and they promise you uh, economic freedoms. But when they get into power, all they do is they restrict your political freedoms, your social freedoms, without enhancing your economic freedoms. On the Democrat side, they say, well, maybe we'll legalize marijuana, we're for gay marriage and stuff. So they're more for your social freedoms, but they're going to tax you to the hilt in order to pay for their various programs. When they get into power, what they do is they don't give you more social freedoms, they don't legalize marijuana or whatever. What they do do is restrict your economic freedoms even more. So you have the seesaw, each group promising you one aspect of freedom, each group taking away your freedoms on the other side. Another fallacy that Americans have is that we have this dichotomy in the United States with the Republicans versus the Democrats. That's not a dichotomy. The Democrats want to control us in one way, the Republicans want to control us in another way, but they both want control. People have used this false dichotomy between, let's say, fascism and communism, corporate socialism and monopoly capitalism, have used these false dichotomies to undermine the truth. At one extreme is totalitarianism. The ultimate form of totalitarianism was communist dictatorship of the, of the proletariat where Stalin ruled a state that was basically a slave state. Very close to that though was the fascist totalitarianism of Hitler. At the other extreme is not uh, more dictatorship. You can't have dictatorships on both extremes because if dictatorship on both extremes you have no freedom. The freedom has to be at one extreme and it goes from freedom to a lack of freedom. Dictatorship is at one end of the scale and freedom is at the other end of the scale. Unfortunately, negative influences far worse than left and right have crept in. The Federal Reserve, set up by banking architect Paul Warburg, is a European-style central bank, complete with all the inherent problems of the old world. Banking principles diametrically opposed by the founders. Alien concepts, such as backing money by debt instead of gold. Lending out more money than you have in the vault. Printing up money so banks can stimulate the very economy they just crashed. All this so bankers can charge more for interest and snap up real estate assets with straw buyers in recession markets. Thanks to the Fed, Congress can bypass the public's representatives and wage war with money that has been literally created out of thin air. Are any of these American ways? Did the founders set up the Constitution so John Maynard Keynes, an economist indoctrinated in the environment of our former enemy, should stamp their war-torn European philosophies into the very soul of our nation? Something isn't right here. In Keynesian economics, they endorse the Federal Reserve System. And to print money out of thin air is, is really fraud because they're stealing from people, stealing the value from some people. So they're completely different. But Keynesianism is not socialism, but it leads to socialism. Socialism is where the government controls supply and demand and prices and the whole work. But Keynesianism allows uh, the market to function to a degree with a lot of intervention, a lot of regulations, a lot of taxes, a lot of planning, and a lot of inflation. 
How can the original intent of the founders shine through when our entire economic system and cultural institutions have been perverted by ideologies of a world we worked so desperately to get away from? Starting with World War I, starting with Woodrow Wilson, on down through World War II, down through Vietnam War, now to the War on Terrorism, all these wars are always used to frighten the American people into accepting the expansion of government, supposedly to protect us against an evil, terrible enemy. The actual expansion came about through the Supreme Court adding some words to the Commerce Clause. They said, Congress has the power to regulate commerce or whatever affects commerce. And that's rather a radical departure from the Constitution because imagine if you added that, those words to every other provision of the Constitution, why shouldn't you? If you can add it to one, you can add it to others. You have essentially unlimited government. Well, what that has done is it has given Congress the power to control not only all true commercial activities, but all sorts of things that are entirely local that are related to commercial activity. So for instance, you had the gun-free schools law. Based upon what theory? Well, a gun goes through commerce and eventually ends up in somebody's hands. And there he's within a thousand feet of a school, a hundred feet of a school, whatever the distance is. And so Congress can regulate his possession at that point in time. Well, his possession at that point in time is not a commercial transaction by any stretch of the imagination. How can Congress regulate it? Well, because this implement that he's holding in his hand at one time move through commerce. Well, of course, if you follow that theory out, they can control every aspect of your life. How much cornflakes do you eat in the morning? Well, you eat one bowl. Maybe you should only eat half a bowl of cornflakes. Can there be a statute telling you how many cornflakes to eat in the morning? Sure, because where did those cornflakes come from? Well, they came from Battle Creek, Michigan. The Supreme Court has perverted the Constitution, making decisions that used to be made democratically at the local level. The Congress has the power in the Constitution Article 3, Section 2, to circumscribe the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and say, stay out of that area. That is our area, that is the state's area. You are not to get into that. Judges don't decide these issues, people do. After the formation of the Fed and selling the public on the New Deal, it wasn't long before Congress realized it had both the ability and the philosophical justification to print up endless amounts of elastic currency, what we call fiat money. It also wasn't long before Congress realized it needed more and more money in order to build a military machine it could use to spread democracy to the world, as Bush too might say. The Federal Reserve, when it came in, um, aggravated all the worst problems of the economy. It's aggravated and caused the Great Depression. It's aggravated and caused the last depression. And it'll continue to cause more depression. Before the Federal Reserve, every, every economic system has ups and downs, but they corrected themselves much more quickly and they corrected themselves because people were able to, had the freedom to uh, shift their attention, to be able to create solutions to the problem and to be able to exercise their God-given wisdom and intelligence to, uh, to be able to do business with each other. Ever wonder why congressmen were so eager to sacrifice tariffs for NAFTA's free trade? It's because tariffs don't amount to much when Congress can print up all the fiat money it wants through the Federal Reserve System. Yes, monetizing endless fiat money was the answer opinion leader economist John Maynard Keynes suggested to Roosevelt in his 1933 open letter. John Maynard Keynes. I lay overwhelming emphasis on the increase of national purchasing power resulting from governmental expenditure which is financed by loans and is not merely a transfer through taxation from existing incomes. Nothing else counts in comparison with this. By these words, Keynes, the most prominent economist of the time, laid out the philosophic rationale for endless government borrowing and endless government spending of fiat money. Roosevelt bit. And now we're addicted. We're addicted to the, the programs and the, even the banking system is addicted to ever increasing the money supply and artificially manipulating interest rates low. 
And on the short run, it does seem to help. Uh, just recently, you know, the Fed pumped in $200 billion and the stock market loved it. But in time, when everybody knows they created $200 billion of new money, the value of the dollar goes down, which has happened since then. Keynes knew exactly what he was doing. You can go back to a gold standard, say, of 1,000 an ounce. But what do you do if they keep spending and spending and borrowing and borrowing? People suddenly realize that these dollars aren't really worth that much gold, and they will demand the gold. Sounds to me, given the state of affairs we're in today, well over $10 trillion in debt, immersed in perpetual wars, fascist multinationals dominating Congress, that we have allowed serious corruption to seep into the American experiment. We may think we want our independence from Europe, defeated communism and Nazi fascism. But did we? We have traveled the road to totalitarianism almost, almost to the very end. Austrian free market economics is really the answer. And uh, that's the system that uh, we should be following. And more or less, even though it was not known uh, at, the, at the time our country was founded, it was more or less classical uh, economics and classical liberalism that was very close to what the Austrians teach today. Tragic that wine drinking, pot smoking, angle challenged baby boomers would so recklessly thwart the wisdom of the founding fathers by allowing their banking system and economy to be so influenced by European financial philosophies. Philosophies that over the past century have created a living hell of endless wars and empires, as we have seen. The intent of the founders was to establish a nation that was different from the ways of Europe. And they did. The United States is different. Not only that, it's the greatest nation that has ever existed. America is not a universal nation or a multicultural nation as CFR globalists writing in foreign affairs would have reality-challenged baby boomers believe. It's a distinct nation, distinct with its own language, laws, history, and cultural background. We are different from the rest of the world. Yes, we even drive on the right side of the road because Europeans drive on the left. Americans and reality-challenged baby boomers need to wake up and smell the Constitution. The famous quote from Franklin was uh, that after he left the Constitutional Convention, he says, it's, we've given you a republic if you can keep it. And uh, obviously we haven't done a very good job. I think if people want to live in a democracy or a republic such as ours, then they're more than free to do so. And we should lead by example, not by force. Citizens need to get familiar with the original intent of the founders and realize that the forces of corporate fascism have been raping and pillaging the United States for decades. But to realize the dream and keep this magnificent republic alive, all Americans need to do is don't patronize the largest Fed member banks and fascist multinational corporations. Connect up with the original intent of the founders and get active applying the U.S. Constitution. Americans and history-challenged baby boomers should understand what it means to be a self-governing nation. They need to understand the Constitution from a philosophical point of view, not just a mechanical point of view. Why were certain things emphasized and others not? Why is a well-regulated militia necessary to the security of a free state? 
Why is the term general welfare the only term that appears twice? What principles lay behind the Constitution and why? If citizens better understood these things, they would be able to go about their lives with a greater appreciation of the rare opportunity they have been given to live in the American experiment. Instead of pessimism, they would have the realization that America has just begun, that the future will be even more incredible than anyone imagined. Take three steps and it will happen. Yes, the corporate fascists that dominate American industry and global commerce will threaten and flail. Yes, there will be a percentage of religious fanatics that attack the United States or hate us because we flourish and prosper. And yes, there will always be secular robots and iconoclasts that hate traditional values. But the founders somehow knew all this for they had studied thousands of years of history and countless failed civilizations. From these lessons, they built the Constitution of the United States, and this document has succeeded as no other. The blueprint for the longest standing republic in history is in your hands. Eventually, even the corporate fascists, the Islamic terrorists, and our current special interest dominated Congress will see the light and become part of the general welfare. In the meantime, don't give liberty challenged members of society the power to enslave us all just because a relative few have so little faith in the original intent of the Founders and the United States Constitution. The Constitution of the United States represents no threat whatsoever to our form of government. <laughs>